All right. Well, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I, I'll uh, do my best to be uh, as on, on time as we can so that uh, we can get to some questions. Um, this is our disclaimer, being a public com publicly traded company. Uh, we could we're, There could be forward-looking statements as we have these conversations, et cetera. Uh, please refer to this and when you get a chance to look at the, the presentation again in the future. Uh, just a little bit about Encore. Uh, we're focused on being a uh, uh, the next premier uranium production company in the United States. We're focusing on in situ recovery uh, as being our primary production source uh, of uh, of uranium deposits, uh, starting in Texas and uh, uh, and then also eventually uh, over over a period of time exploiting our uh, properties in New Mexico using in such technology. Uh, we're real proud of our team, a technical team that we put together. Uh, we have some of the, uh, the most experienced folks in the U.S. Uh, US uranium industry and uh, with that focus on in situ recovery. Now, we'll get to a little bit more on those folks, our team, in, in a short bit. Uh, we see an improving uranium market. Uh, we see they some principally due to significant uh, changes in the supply-demand picture. Uh, since 2017, uh, uranium demand has gone up by 17%, uh, with more reactors on now than there were prior to the, the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear incident. And uh, even though Japan is mostly still shut down, we have reactors being shut down. More reactors are operating today than there were prior to that time. And also, there's more reactors under construction at this moment than there were uh, 10 years ago. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a sign of, of increasing demand, but also we're seeing a reduction in, in, in supply uh, as more and more mines have been shut down, either through uh, just pure depletion or through, uh, as a result of the current uh, pricing, uh, we see less supply coming on. In fact, since 2017, global supply is down by 24%. So one can easily see the disconnect. And what's filling that gap right now is principally uh, secondary supplies and inventories, both of which are finite. Um, and we see that in the next couple of years as being uh, the catalyst for uh, supporting new production. One of the things we did this year, or at the, actually at the end of 2020, is we, what we, we accomplished what we consider to be a uh, transformational uh, acquisition, and that is the uh, uh, acquisition of the two licensed processing facility down in Texas. And those are key because they're obviously in situ recovery, but also they represent two of the 11 licensed in situ recovery facilities in the country. Uh, and so it, that's critical. And uh, we think that's, uh, that's a game changer for us. Plus, we've also effectively doubled our, our uh, size of our resources and holdings in New Mexico. And we've got leverage into uh, new production uh, opportunities in Texas. A little bit about the company, a lot of changes. As John mentioned earlier, uh, we've uh, our, our current uh, market capitalization as of uh, uh, yesterday was $212 million Canadian. Uh, we have 193 million shares outstanding, another 19.9 million uh, warrants out. Our fully diluted count is 224 million shares. Now, <clears throat> we just complete, we're in the process of completing a, uh, a private placement, uh, which uh, we originally targeted to be, have 8 million shares, uh, I mean, $8 million Canadian raise uh, at, a, at a target level of a uh, dollar share with a, with a half warrant. And uh, we've been able to supersize that to $15 million total, which uh, was uh, pretty exciting with the, with the demand that uh, we saw. It shows the, the investor confidence in the uranium space. We believe it shows con uh, investor confidence in our, our ability to execute on our strategy. Our management team, uh, I think one of the, the, the highlights of our management team is we have uh, Bill Sheriff, who is our executive chairman. Bill's, uh, uh, one of our key points of our strategy, and Bill's fond to talk about it, is that we're looking at, in addition to uh, uh, just getting into production and, and meeting the, the market demands and, and, and exploiting our properties. We also look at growing the company uh, potentially through mergers and acquisitions. And, and Bill has, has, has brought has quite a bit of experience with that as, uh, as uh, his history has been with uh, his prior time with Energy Metals. 
on the technical side and operational side, we have Dennis Stover, uh, who's been in the industry. He's an industry veteran, and he's had uh, uh, a lot of experience in in-situ recovery. In fact, uh, he's one of the original, original patent holders of some of the in-situ recovery technology uh, that uh, was in play early in the process that made it commercial. You know, we have uh, people like Richard Cherry and, and Mark Palizza and others on our, our team that uh, round it out. Uh, here's our technical team. We've also added to that, uh, this team that's not reflected here. We have uh, a new CFO, which we announced, uh, who's got a lot of, announced a couple of weeks ago, who's got a lot of uh, industry experience uh, in, in uranium and uh, as, as well as operational experience. And we also have uh, uh, a top line Texas exploration geologist who joined us as well, who's, uh, that we look forward to uh, using his talents to uh, uh, to uh, propel us into production. This is a summary of kind of what we have now. We're focusing on the short term on the uh, immediately on getting ready to get into production. We have two licensed in situ recovery facilities in Texas. Uh, we have at, we have current mineral leases with historic uranium resources on those. Uh, we also have a dominant the dominant position in New Mexico uh, with over 300,000 acres and significant uh, both uh, 43 and 101 resources as well as significant uh, historic resources. We have other other properties and some, some uh, retro pipes in Arizona as well as our interest in Group 11 technologies. I'm gonna focus on Texas for the moment and that's kind of where my heart started. That's where I started my, my career uh, we, with the acquisition, we acquired two production facilities. That's the Rosita Processing Facility located in the center, more to the center left of, of the map. Uh, and then Kingsville Dome, which is located to the southeast. Uh, those are two uh, operating facilities. And I actually started my career at these sites. I started at uh, Kingsville Dome in 1987. Uh, through the, the construction and startup and operating of that facility and, and the same thing with Rosita in 1992. Uh, and so and both of these have had very successful operating lives and production histories. Uh, they recent, Kingsville recently was upgraded uh, to a central processing plant back in uh, to operate satellite facilities back in 2006. And Rosita had the same uh, investment back in 2008. Uh, the other properties we have on the map, Vasquez, which is located to the southwest, is uh, that actually is a depleted ore body uh, that's coming on board. We're in the process of finalizing our uh, the cleanup on that, and we expect to have it fully released and uh, uh, off the books by the end of this year, or at least uh, applied to get off the books with the state of Texas. Uh, and then we have Butler Ranch to the north, which is a it's an exciting project, has significant historic resources and a and a and a historic uranium product, production area. So we see the upside there, and we've also uh, we also have a significant amount of information, and we're in the process of uh, acquiring other uh, properties with his, with known resources uh, to feed this. And the reason why we get excited about Texas is because it not only has it had a historic uh, production history. It's in a. It's got a lot of upside, as you can see down below. The USGS has estimated that there's a potential to discover another 220 million pounds of uh, resources in that area that could be produced at a cost, uh, reasonable and competitive cost. Uh, and also, Texas being an agreement state, uh, all the decisions decisions are local. They're all made in Texas. Uh, there's very low federal influence, so. Uh, it, and it has a very well-defined regulatory environment. A little bit about, a little bit more granular on our, our new uh, production facilities, our new old ones, but we consider them new and exciting. We have Kingsville Dome and Rosita. Both of those facilities have a name plate capacity of 800,000 pounds per year. Uh, to clarify that, that 800,000 pounds is, is per site is limited by their drying capacity. Uh, which is what takes what we need to package uranium. The processing side can have uh, significantly higher capacities. And in fact, uh, the way these plants are configured, they can easily have additional drying capacity bolted on. I'd like to, I'd like to call it modular. Obviously, it's always a little bit more technical than that. But uh, 
the uh, but they can actually be added to and, and conceptually, if we wanted to, we could actually move the dry, drying capacity from Kingsville to Rosita for the short term as we uh, look to uh, prov provide uh, uh, our initial uh, production capacity at Rosita. And that's and while we're focusing on Rosita, it's actually the one that has the, the shortest timeline to be production capable. Uh, the investment that was done back in 2008 uh, by the previous owner uh, has has been maintained. It wasn't fully completed before the uranium markets disappeared on them. Uh, also, it's in, it just, it's it's in much better shape at this moment. And uh, but uh, we we're retaining the option to also to bring Kingsville on uh, at a later time as a potential supplemental production facility. Those things will be as we go through our our uh, planning and economic analysis, uh, particularly as we uh, identify new uh, ore bodies, et cetera, we'll have a better handle on how we're gonna plan and operate one or both of these facilities. And they're all designed to act as uh, satellite uh, central processing plants. So uh, much in the same vein as they do, uh, as been historically done up in Wyoming, uh, these sites are uh, ideal for this and uh, the beauty of it with this acquisition is that we also got a trained workforce. So there's uh, there's the ability to expand that workforce, but we have people to be able to train them, not just uh, uh, so we can actually make this happen faster and more safely and efficiently. One of the beauties of Texas is that there's a whole lot of unknown that we know about. Uh, the In addition to the resources we got, we obtained uh, with this acquisition both at the remaining resources at Rosita, as well as at Butler Ranch. Uh, there's other opportunities. We just acquired a significant database of uh, a former uh, uranium company that uh, had actually licensed facilities and never operated them. So we, we and they've done quite a, most of that work is very recent, as recent as 2017. So we have a high confidence in it and uh, we're gonna, we're actually beginning to exploit that. One of the things that uh, Texas brings that uh, you don't see, say, up in Athabasca, et cetera, is that uh, the geology is quite a bit different. It's a sediment. It's a very young sedimentary deposit uh, that, uh, and you can see from that lower picture uh, with the very, with just the cuttings out of one drill hole with changes in colors, it shows that there's a very active geochemical uh, boundary. And uh, as, a res as a result, there's two things that are difficult to do. One is to have consistent ability to capture cores, uh, to do assays, uh, and the other is to uh, uh, is the fact that with this high uh, activity of geochemistry, uh, uranium and, and radium, which we use as a proxy uh, in our well logging, is uh, not in equilibrium. So we can't just use radium to calculate, estimate the uranium content. We have to have a physical content because uh, uranium measurements. And by using what's called prompt vision neutron, we actually have a downhole wireline system to get real time in situ uranium assays. It's uh, it's pretty granular on it, but it's a, it's a, it uses neutrons to actually excite the uranium in the, in the ore body and allows us to get a better estimate of what the uranium content grade is and allows us to do better resource and as well as well field planning. A little bit about our, we'll go into New Mexico. Uh, we see New Mexico as our future. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of work we have to do in New Mexico. If, if anybody's followed the story in New Mexico, uh, one knows that there's a history of production. I believe that over 500 million pounds of uranium was produced in New Mexico and I expect another 550 million pounds to be available. It's economic at, at uh, reasonable prices. Uh, out there, and as a result, uh, we see that as an opportunity. But we're going to have to we're going to have to do some extra homework. Uh, New Mexico is not a slam dunk. There's a uh, the there's a legacy of the historic uranium mining that goes way back even to the Manhattan Project. Uh, and uh, as a result, and a lot of it ha happened near on the the, the the tribal lands, and so we believe we have to do. We know we're going to have to do some work. There's models for it uh, to execute uh, where we can look at potential tribal, uh, public, private, public uh, uh, opportunities uh, that uh, allow us to uh, to provide some opportunity for the, the tribe uh, and the workers on the tribe to actually take a, at least have some uh, opportunity to, to 
to participate in, in the, uh, the, the opportunity there rather than just, uh, you know, just saying we're bringing a bunch of jobs and doing some uh, local uh, public works, et cetera. And it's a long-term investment. Uh, the, the Navajo Nation is already doing that with other opportunities uh, through various uh, com- uh, tribal corporations. And there's a good model for that as well up in Saskatchewan with respect to uh, Cameco and how they are working with the First Nations. We see that as a good model to apply in New Mexico. So we see New Mexico in a five to 10 year window. Uh, we're focusing, even though we have significant uh, conventional properties, which we see are, are, are very valuable, uh, we're gonna focus on in-situ recovery because that's what we know. We, the reason why we're focusing as a company on in-situ recovery is because of capital expenditures are relatively low uh, compared to a conventional mine. Uh, the licensing and, and uh, permitting is, is, is very well defined. And, uh, and when we're done, uh, we don't have significant uh, excavations, nor do we have significant tailings impoundments as a result. In fact, when, when an in-situ recovery facility is completed, uh, there's almost no, fo- there's no surface uh, impacts left. And the groundwater as well has to be cleaned up uh, to meet the uh, background standards. So, uh, we see that as something we know how to do. I've done it in my career, and our, te- our technical team have, uh, have a lot of experience at doing that. So we, we know how to build that into our, our planning. Uh, and, uh, and so we can execute. And like I said, we see New Mexico as our future. And you can see from the picture, we, uh, we control, control a significant portion of the ground there. Uh, we have significant resources, and I'll keep flipping here. Uh, this is our, our historic resources as well as our 43101 uh, resources. And as you can see, they're relatively significant. Some of the more project detail, Crown Butte, Hosta Butte has, uh, uh, is, the, is uh, actually, Crown Point is actually partially licensed uh, already. Uh, and uh, it, uh, in, under the Laramide Resources uh, license. So there's an opportunity there once they decide to start moving forward. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to to work with them on that. Uh, we also have a significant venture property named Juan Tafoya. And the interesting part of this, Juan Tafoya came from the Westwater acquisition. We already had the Marquez. And literally these two projects are one project separated by a fence. So we're able, right now we're in the process of updating the technical report uh, for this project combined and hope to have that released soon once it's done. Uh, we've got other projects such as Nose Rock, uh, West Largo, Ambrosia Lake Treeline, which is uh, in the Grants Mineral District. And finally, our, what I like to call our secret sauce, uh, the, our data. Uh, we have significant data databases. And, and one of our philosophies is that we don't, we don't believe we have to go out and do a lot of any Greenville exploration. We believe that there's already enough known uranium deposits in the country based on that other companies have already done back in the 70s and 80s. We had a lot of oil and gas companies and, and uh, large mining companies going out exploring for new uranium deposits and identifying them. Uh, it's just a matter, it's a matter of taking the information, putting it together into a strategy, and then acquiring the properties and putting them into production. Uh, and uh, we believe that we get a heads, we've got a leg up on that uh, simply because we have such an, a, a broad database that brings uh, brings it all together. And we just added to that recently with this uh, this uh, acquisition of additional data that I mentioned earlier. So we see this as an opportunity to expand our reach beyond what we already and and also to uh, strengthen our production profile going forward. Um, the, you know, as, as I mentioned, our goal is to become the premier ISR uranium production company in the U.S. Uh, we have significant resources. We believe our strength is in our team. Uh, and as well as New Mexico, opportunity gives us a, uh, a long-term growth plan. One of the other things we see as an opportunity as well as potentials for consolidation in the uranium industry. Uh, there are as I mentioned, there were 11 licensed facilities. We, we control two of those now uh, when we talk about in-situ recovery. We do believe that uh, by consolidation brings strength, but also brings cost savings and cost efficiency. Uh, 
when we look at look comp competing on a global level with uh, uh, larger corporations, uh, we believe there's strength in, uh, in numbers, and those numbers we see by com uh, can be effectively uh, done through consol industry consolidation, and uh, we intend to keep looking into that going forward, and that's part of our growth plan as well. And that's uh, the presentation, and uh, John, it's, if you've got any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Okay, thanks, Paul. Can you hear me okay still? Yes. Okay. All right, we'll start off. We do have a few questions that have come in. And again, uh, if you haven't asked your question yet, uh, throw it in the Q&A now. So first question, any estimates on what kind of uranium contracting price you would need to secure prior to bringing uh, these facilities online to produce? Any estimate on your all-in sustaining cost at the Texas facilities? Sure. Well, first of all, I, I got to caveat this that we have not done a PEA on the uh, preliminary economic analysis on the uh, the Texas properties yet. Uh, we've had them for less than a couple of months. So, um, but I've done. We've got a lot of experience in operating down there. We believe we can be competitive. Uh, not at today's uh, spot prices, but uh, we can be competitive uh, with uh, better. You know, with about fifty percent of the uh, the world's production. Uh, there's a good indicator that Trade Tech publishes uh, uh, every month, which is called a production price, production cost indicator. And that is published at around $43.30 and 40, $43 cents per pound uh, average production cost to incentivize new production. We believe, based on my experience of working in Texas and, and knowing these, these ore bodies, et cetera, uh, I believe that uh, all in sustaining costs will be somewhere less than that. A published uh, cost, average cost. Uh, and uh, with respect to sales price, uh, obviously we would love to get as high a price as we can so we can bring as much return to our shareholders as we want, as we are able to. But uh, we believe that we can be competitive uh, with uh, the likes of, uh, you know, when you when you listen to our competitors such as Cameco, et cetera, they, they talk about pricing need to be in the high 40s. Uh, for some of their to do new contracting and even in the mid 50s for uh, incentivizing restarting uh, locations like MacArthur River. I believe that uh, their contracting levels, they're, what they're saying they need for contracting, uh, at least to, uh, to assign new contracts, those would, be, those would be some of the ranges that we would see, we would try to be, we're going to be competitive for uh, and uh, do the best we can to, uh, to do better than that. Uh, I know that was kind of a roundabout way to get there, and, but without having established a PEA, it's hard to, to pinpoint numbers. Um, I guess a follow-up question to that timeline on a PA, are you planning on doing that this year? Uh, yes, yes. We have uh, some uh, some of the properties we picked up already have uh, some uh, good data. We're going to do some, one of the things we're doing with this private placement we did, some of the funds are going to go to drilling to uh Update the uh, upgrade the resource estimates from historic to 43101 compliant resources, and with that, we intend to do a PEA uh, as well uh, to bolster our our, uh, our our planning. Okay, so mineral resource estimates in 2021 PEA maybe early 2022. Does that sound about right? Well, uh, I think we can probably do them together. Do them okay. one report. Okay. Um, question from Barry Allen, analyst at Laurentian Bank Securities. Uh, he's just asking for any estimates for time to cash flow. Uh, well, obviously, we're going to wait on Mark. Market's going to drive a lot of that. You know, we see the market improving enough in the, uh, into the 20, you know, 2022, late 2022, 2020, early 2023 that will incentivize our, us to go into production. I expect that uh, if if the market indicators act as we expect, we would be uh, generating cash starting in 2023, probably uh, second quarter. Okay. Um, what do you see coming out of the new Biden administration that will support your strategy? Uh, is there anything from the new administration that you think will negatively impact your plans? And if so, how do you mitigate those impacts? Well, we see a lot of, first of all, on the positive side, you know, from the Biden administration with their, their clean air agenda, uh, they're focusing on obviously carbon uh, reduction. 
but truly it's a, a clean air objective. And uh, we see nuclear, is, they've stated in their policy positions that nuclear is a key part of it. Uh, and as long as we can keep nuclear power plants operating, we have a customer base to keep us uh, in business. Uh, we see that uh, there, there's a desire within the Biden administration to have a, even though, you know, it's one would say it's almost like it was from the previous administration to have a domestic supply chain uh, to support those plans. Uh, we believe that the uranium mining has to be part of that to make it happen. Uh, you need uranium for nuclear energy. And uh, the, if one looks at the rest of the world, there's not a whole bunch more material coming into the market uh, at this time. So we see an opportunity for the domestic side. Uh, and uh, on, there's always challenges with a new administration coming in. Uh, we, you know, I have to, I'm, my expectation going forward with respect to the Biden administration is that we expect to see a lot, some of the policies coming out with respect to that we saw in the Obama administration. Uh, we're already starting to see some of that uh, with, with respect to uh, some of the executive orders. Uh, our intent, you know, obviously, if without uh, becoming a stakeholder in those processes, no, the, uh, the uranium industry is relatively small. And without uh, becoming a stakeholder in the process, we got it's hard to let the, the administration know uh, what their impacts are. So we intend, you know, we're working with some trade associations to be, uh, to try to, uh, we're working with, uh, to get inside into the Biden administration as well as into the halls of Congress virtually these days uh, to uh, assure that uh, the uranium story remains viable and that uh, uh, that uh, effectively they, there's, they do no harm going forward. We're, we're supportive of their, their clean energy targets uh, and, uh, and we believe that we can, you know, the U S has, in my opinion, and that's all it is, has the best jurisdiction to do, uh, do uranium mining. We have the most stringent rules, the, the, the requirements for environmental and health protection are some of the strongest, uh, you know, Canada's up there, Australia's up there as well. Uh, we believe we can do it better, uh, than elsewhere. A, a lot of the other places in the world here. And that's the message we're going to take to the administration is that, uh, you know, we're, you know, we've got to communicate to them that we can do it better than, than what was done in the past uh, and, and stay ahead of uh, some of the, the people who would like to tar or paint the industry with what happened in the past, which is well beyond us now. Okay. Um, a question here. You might have already answered it. Uh, New Mexico is economic at reasonable prices. Can you elaborate more on what reasonable prices would be for these assets? I think they're referring to a statement you made during your presentation. Yeah. Well, when I talk about reasonable prices, our expectation is that prices will be obviously significantly higher than what they are today. Uh, the the uh, So as, as far as getting to a hard, fast number, uh, I would say that uh, we've got Obviously, we got some more homework to do on our side to, to provide that to the public uh, through uh, additional uh, work on these, the 4301s we're working on. I would say that uh, uh, we would have to have prices that are, you know, higher than what, uh, uh, better than 50%, the percentile of the world production. Uh, so we're talking probably in the high 50s, maybe 60s. Uh, to make it incentivized. Now, that's that's assuming it's conventional mining. Uh, we, you know, we've got to do some work on the in situ side. Uh, I have not evaluated any of that at the moment, but I believe that we can be. I know we can be competitive. I, I'm familiar with uh, the New Mexico in situ recoveries uh, operation or plant, you know, pilot plants and all that stuff from my days when I worked for uranium resources back in the '80s and '90s. Uh, I believe we can be competitive, uh, but to give you a specific number or even a range, it's going to be a little tough right now, premature. Um, question on the plan, uh, use of proceeds from the recent private placement. So I think you touched on some aspects, but yep. so just for uh, 8 million, you had originally gone to market for 8 million. You've upsized that to almost double at 15. Um, so yeah, what the plan for the original 8 million and the extra seven that you'd be taking? Sure. So uh, the original plan with the eight million was uh, there were several pro uh, things we we're going to be doing. One is we're going to execute on our our uh, 
work at Rosita to bring it into uh, uh, production capable. Uh, we believe that we can do that for less than a million dollars and do that within a year. Uh, the And also we need to maintain our existing facility at uh, Kingsville Dome. Uh, so there's costs associated with that. Uh, there's some reclamation work that wasn't uh, completed by the end of the transaction that we need to uh, finish. Uh, and those have a benefit to, to us uh, because once that work is done, uh, we we will be uh, able to re start releasing some of the properties that are, are currently held and uh, reduce our holding cost as well as reduce bonding costs. So that we see that as a as directly impacting the bottom line once it's executed. Uh, the other is we intend to do some drilling. I mentioned about uh, firming up resources for our 43101 reports, and also we want to we want to start uh, exploiting some resources that I mentioned about that we've identified through our our data data acquisitions uh, to bring those into our production uh, visibility into production visibility and so we'll have to do some drilling there also some lease acquisitions etc uh, and also I mentioned uh, we also are working on some MA activities uh, it always strengthens your hand when you're doing MA activities uh, to uh, have that uh, the financial uh, support and uh, and so we see that as a as an important key uh, to supporting that M and A as we try as we work to grow the company. Okay, and a sign of strength, uh, obviously, as well, the fact that your share price is holding above the you know the financing price, like yep. fifteen percent above, even with the upsize, uh, another sign of strength. Um, were you going to say something, Paul? No, no, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I was just going to ask a quick follow up to that question. So, what um, for the the activities directed on exploration, like the drilling, the PEA, and and resource definition? What do you have a rough number of how many million would be allocated to that side of things? Not yet. You know, the we we hadn't uh, we we were looking at a, a much more modest program uh, prior to uh, the financing. Uh, we're not going to go out and spend it like crazy, but uh, we certainly want to be, it gives us more opportunities to do more. Uh, we were looking at a very limited program uh, that was going to be probably less than a million bucks. Uh, but now with, uh, it, this gives us more leverage to go and pick up, uh, to uh, develop some properties that actually have a faster timeline to production, uh, in my opinion, uh, that uh, could uh, leverage uh, Rosita to be ready to go much sooner than, uh, than I hope, you know, that much sooner than uh, otherwise, I, if we didn't do this work, pardon me okay. for getting, yeah. Um, there's a few questions here around the macro side of things. You know, uh, do you feel that we're in an Iranian bubble is, you know, is now the time uh, to be in, uh, investing in uranium? You want to speak to that at all? Sure. Uh, so, I kind of put things in my historic, my, my own career historic uh, perspective. And so in 2003, uh, I was uh, actually 2004, I was approached to get back into move from uh, a large company where I was doing principally reclamation work and getting ready to get into the copper business uh, to go re-enter the back end of the uranium industry. And I saw some of the same things I'm seeing today. And one is is that uh, there's a disconnect between supply and demand, uh, and 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 so there's and also the fact is that repeatedly we see the fact that deplete the, there's depletion of these inventories that have currently been sustaining the nuclear reactors, uh, nuclear uh, fleets. Uh, these inventories are getting shorter. U utilities are are. For in their perspective, uh, are looking more and more like a, at uh, effectively just-in-time inventories, uh, uh, de you know, increasing their, their risk levels on on their fuel supply. So we see them getting closer and closer to having demands. And in fact, that's been confirmed by conversations I've been having with utilities uh, that uh, the window when they have openings for for new uh, need for supply is getting closer to uh, 2021. Uh, in other words, it's it's one to two years uh, out when they look to, to start trying to fill those gaps than it would have been if I would have been looking at it a few years ago where they had like four or five years of, uh, before they had anything uh, coming open. 
So we're seeing more opportunities. Today. And also the, the, uh, the fact is, is that demand's not going to go down. It's going to increase. But we're not seeing as there's not a whole, there's no new projects coming online right now. So fundamentally, uh, there's going to be, there's becoming a, a greater and greater disconnect between supply and demand and the, the supply needs, which are currently filled by secondaries, principally secondary supplies, those are going away. And they're depleting because you, it's, we don't have an infinite uh, amount of, of uh, material floating in the uh, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the churn, so to speak. And so I see that, you know, from our perspective, and it's opinion only, is that we see this happening sooner. And we believe it's sustainable. And so when I when I try to relate back to the, my 2004 timeline, when we talked about is this a bubble or, or is it uh, sustainable? Based on my experience, everything's you know from the market sense and everything else. It's I believe it's sustainable. Uh, I don't believe we're going to see the spikes that we saw back in 2006 and seven, which were driven by some uh, very uh, very tight constraints that were short lived. Uh, I believe this is going to be sustainable. Uh, the one thing you know we want to do is, is make sure the utilities, uh, our principal customers, feel that they got some security, not only in supply but also in cost. Uh, we can't uh, we can't forget the fact that they need to be cost competitive uh, with other sources of generation, and uh, and and so we can't just basically you know. We want to be competitive. We want them to be competitive, so it'll be sustainable uh, going forward. And I believe that's the case. Okay. So um, on this topic, Paul, I, I did ask someone, an, another uranium company CEO recently, uh, you know, whether they thought the, the run this time would be bigger than the run last time. I mean, there are some factors present today that weren't present uh, last time, but it sounds like you think it will be, you know, it's going to be a strong run, but not kind of that same really violent spike that we got in, in the mid two thousands. That's my, that's what I see. I think it's the, the, just the whole picture is different. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the last spike ran, run up occurred as a result of, uh, but we had the nuclear renaissance. So there was already a desire, you know, you know, expectation was going to be future demand, but that was still on the horizon. Hadn't really hit the ground yet. Uh, and then on top of that, you had the, uh, the the supply interruptions first prompted by the, the fire at Olympic Dam in 2003 and four, or 2004, and then uh, the, the inflows at MacArthur River, and then ultimately the, the big one, which was uh, the inflow at Cigar Lake. Uh, but that wasn't, those weren't long-term. They were short-term impacts. Uh, the difference today is that a lot of the production dis supply dis uh, destruction isn't as a result of instantaneous disrupt uh, supply production uh, disruptions. It's really a, uh, a factor. Like for example, we have significant production in Australia going offline because of depletion. The same thing occurring in Africa, uh, and even even in Kazakhstan. They, if you go and read through the, the material they put out. They see that their their current production levels are not sustainable in the long run, and uh, and as a result, there's an expectation that uh, there's going to be supply is going to be running out. The the difference between today and, and in the past is the other thing is that Kazakhstan hadn't been a factor, and it was a it became a ramp up factor after the market really took off. We also had a black swan event, which is the Fukushima. Fukushima uh, incident that uh, created a, just basically a collapse in confidence in nuclear power. But we can see even today in the headlines uh, of the, the Wall Street Journal had an editorial today talking about uh, the Texas situation, which I got to experience firsthand, uh, where even though uh, the Texas uh, reactor fleet, which consists of four reactors, lost one reactor to a cold weather issue, they still had 75% of their capacity operating when the demand was needed. And two of those, all three of those reactors that were remaining operating ran at 100% capacity. Uh, it showed reliable, the need for baseload energy. And, and uh, the, the fact is, is that, uh, you know, there's constraints on gas to be able to deploy. So it really bolsters the argument that nuclear is necessary going forward. And I'm hoping that that's something that's seen by the Biden administration and we can get 
uh, real good support at the federal level. And that's what I'll see, you know, I see as, as building the narrative that, not only narrative, but building a case that nuclear is here to stay and it's going to be a continuous uh, a demand for our material. And that's why I see this as being sustainable. Okay. I was actually going to ask you that question, what you thought the, the impact of Texas could have on the whole nuclear debate. So I, I think you kind of answered that already. I, I think I agree with you. The, you know, it, there's going to be more eyes on, on nuclear because of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any idea, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I'm, I'm just going to throw out some of my own because we do have a little bit more time. Any idea on how you're going to structure your contracts with utilities? Are you looking to do sort of the same structure that Camelco does? Uh, would you be looking to sell a certain percentage of your production into the spot market? Can you give us any color on that? Well, we're going to take a, uh, you know, everything depends, you know, everything depends on ultimately where we're at uh, at that time. Uh, the So the intent, well, my plan is that it would be great to get some base load contracts or base price uh, contracts, fixed price contracts going forward. Uh, that could help underpin uh, the cash flow uh, for future production or uh, the production at that point. And uh, obviously we want some exposure to the market. Obviously, we want to be able to get some upside ability to uh, see higher prices. So uh, in the past, uh, I've always, uh, when I worked for prior companies, uh, we've always focused on having less than half of our product or about half of our production or maybe up to 60% of our production under contracts. And the balance either exposed through uh, an offtake agreement uh, that uh, has, has, is all in the spot market or just directly into the spot. Uh, in order to show there's upside, but also th there's another factor why I do that is that if there's any interruptions or, or issues with being able to deliver, uh, we want to have the capacity to be able to deliver those, those base contracts uh, so we can assure that there's cash flow coming in and in uh, that way that uh, there's, we're mitigating production risk, but also we're, we're mitigating any price risk that's out there going forward. Okay. Um, there was a question around, I think it's kind of getting to the, it looks like it was deleted, but it, it's one that does come up um, and it's around the subject of waste from the nuclear yep. industry. Uh, I think that is, if my, my opinion, certainly one of the impediments that's still sort of, it's, it's a hard one to get around for the industry when you're trying to convince somebody to, to be pro-nuclear thoughts on, on that. Well, First of all, the nuclear waste issue in the United States, I can only, I'm going to focus on the United States because other company, other countries seem to have figured it out. Uh, in the United States, it's really political. It's not a, it's not a technical issue. It's not a technical concern. There's ways to, to build repositories that can be safe and protective of the environment for the long period of time. Uh, and so that, that's one of the issues that, that uh, gets brought up a lot and it always becomes a, quote unquote, impediment for building new reactors. Uh, we have to get to a, a solution for that. And uh, there's been a blue ribbon panel put it together in the United States to come up and solve that solution. But that blue ribbon panel has been in existence for over 10 years, and I don't think they've delivered a product yet. Uh, and that's concerning. Uh, in reality, what we have is uh, probably 100 or 50 different uh, nuclear storage locations right now at each of the reactor facilities. Uh, and that creates a challenge. Uh, that's where the challenge is that it's safer to put it in one place and have it spread around over the country. Uh, we got to get beyond that. Uh, I do believe that uh, the, the nuclear waste issue is, is uh, it's more political. The if one I, I remember a, a comparison, of course, it's probably changed since then. Is that uh, you know back when I started in this industry, I'm going to say probably let's go back 20 years ago all the nuclear waste that came off of the reactors would fit on a football field up to the 50 yard line, five feet high. Uh, it's a pretty small footprint when you compare uh, just waste coming off other streams. Now that number is probably, it's probably filled up a full football field by this time, uh, but it's still a manageable quantity if we can just agree to where it goes. And I think that'll get solved sometime, I hope sooner than later. Uh, oh, one new question just came in. Just a second here. 
Uh, oh, Encore. Okay, just give me sorry about this. So Encore share price has had a great run in the past six months and the market cap has grown significantly given Encore's business model and in a $70 per pound uranium price environment, full production scenario, what would be a reasonable market cap for the company? Okay, this is where I kind of wish Bill Sheriff was on the call with me. <laughs> He's better at that than I am. Uh, I, I would say we would have, you know, I, and of course, you know, I have to be careful about, you know, the forward looking statements and all that stuff. But I, I think that uh, we would have a very, a, a, we certainly would be well above where we're at today uh, going forward. I, I think that uh, the getting the production of seventy dollar per pound uh, market would be generating cash, uh, and uh, I think that would provide us opportunities for growth, supporting gr our growth scenario. And obviously, with that, you would see it up, the market cap would have to expand to accommodate that going forward. I, you know, I. I I don't have a good gauge on on how that looks today. There's probably people who are much better at that than I am. All right. Um, a question from my doppelganger here, also from a John Smith, not me. Um, are you looking at Wyoming to expand the company's projects? Well, yeah. Uh, so the uh, just so everybody understands, I spent quite a bit of, you know, a significant part of my career in, in Wyoming. And so I have a, uh, as much as I have a fondness for Texas, where I grew up and it was my home, I have a strong affinity for Wyoming. I, I love the open spaces. I love the the, the, the the government environment there, the regulatory environment. In fact, I spent a lot of my political capital uh, actually creating a, a an environment in, in Wyoming to where it's an agreement state where before the feds had, the federal government had quite a bit of oversight over what was going on. It, and I was able to work with the Wyoming legislature as well, the governor and, and the, the various agencies to make that happen. And uh, it, it proved to be very beneficial uh, for the Wyoming industry. So I have a, I have a, I, I would, you know, my intention is to at some point get back into Wyoming. We, are, we currently have properties in Wyoming. Uh, as we stand, obviously, they're exploration properties at the moment. But I see opportunities there, either through potential mergers and acquisitions or other ways to, you know, acquisitions of property, projects, etc. cetera. Uh, but I would, you know, Wyoming is a great environment to work. It's a, it's a, uh, and I think, and I've got a lot of experience and also, a lot of my industry colleagues up, are up there too. So I, I have a strong affinity for that. Yes. Yeah, so Wyoming is in the future. Okay. It's also a beautiful place to live too, from what I understand. In places. In places. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you're in Jack, everybody thinks Wyoming looks like Jackson. And most of Wyoming uh, is prairie. Okay. And uh, that's, the, that's the good part. Okay. Because it keeps all the people from wanting to live there. <laughs> so. You can have a population of half a million people in the entire state and drive for miles without seeing anybody. And, and some people don't like that. It's yeah. it's not so bad from my not perspective. Yeah. yeah. Well, Paul, I, I don't see any other questions. Uh, I think that was a great presentation. Uh, wanted to thank you again for, for uh, participating in the conference and being a feature company. Sure. Congrats, obviously, on, you know, on the share price. Uh, like I said, you know, you're up three times from... When we had you on last, uh, clearly, like I said as well, based on the market demand for your financing, there's a lot of people that have, uh, you know, confidence in the company. So it's got to make you feel good as well. Um, yeah. And the information on the screen here, if people are looking for more info, then just the use the investor relations contact is where you direct them. Yes, please. Okay. okay. All right. So with that, uh, we'll conclude this session. Um, there will be, as there always is, a survey at the end. So we do ask you, if you don't mind uh, filling that out, uh, if you want management at Encore Energy to contact you for a follow-up discussion, if you answer yes to the, you know, do you want management to contact you question, uh, we will pass that information on and they'll arrange to get in touch with you. Um, otherwise, you will be taken directly to, uh, to our next presentation. Uh, which will be in about eight minutes. So we'll see everybody there in eight minutes. And thanks again, Paul. Stay safe. I uh, hope everything is okay for you in Texas. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. And thanks, everybody, for listening.